Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Kevin Kenny. I'm the director of Glucksman Ireland House, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event with Marcus Radiger and Kian McMahon in conversation uh, with Hidetaka Hirota. Professor Radiger is joining us from uh, Pittsburgh, Professor McMahon from Las Vegas, Professor Hirota from Tokyo. Some of us are in New York and uh, we have an audience of several hundred from around the United States, uh, Europe and beyond. My colleague, uh, Professor Kimberly McLean da Costa from NYU's Gallatin School and the Sociology Department will introduce our speakers. Before I hand things over to Professor da Costa, uh, let me just say a few words um, about the format of today's event. So uh, Professor Hirota will begin by asking our two authors to say a few words um, about the two uh, quite different uh, but related uh, books they have written. Uh, Marcus Radiker's classic, The Slave Ship, a Human History, published in 2007, and Kean McMahon's The Coffin Ship, Life and Death at Sea During the Great Irish Famine, published earlier this year in the Glucksman Irish Diaspora series um, by NYU Press. And then after a conversation uh, moderated by Professor Hirota, we'll open it up to what I think will be a lively conversation. If you have questions, if you have comments, just please put them in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, okay, so now over to um, Professor DaCosta. Um, Professor De Costa specializes in the sociology of racial inequality and the contemporary production of racial boundaries. Uh, her book, Making Multiracials, State, Family and Market in the Redrawing of the Color Line, explores the creation of mixed and multiracial identity in the United States. She teaches, as I mentioned, in the Gallatin School in Sociology on race, social mobility, consumerism, and the commercialization of intimate life, uh, she also plays a central role, a directing role indeed, in NYU's prison education program. And together with our esteemed uh, colleague, Dr. Miriam Nyan Gray, Professor de Costa has organized a major international conference that we're gonna be running here throughout November. Some way, today's event is separate, but it's a lovely lead in, uh, into the theme of the conference. Where do we go from here? Uh, revisiting Black Irish relations and responding to a transnational moment. Uh, that conference and today's um, event also come out of our Black, Brown and Green Voices initiative um, led by Dr. Miriam Nyan Gray, where we're trying to recapture um, the lost, a hidden conversation and a heritage uh, involving people of Irish and African descent uh, in the United States. Uh, that's all looking ahead to November, but for now, for the matter at hand, let me uh, turn it over to Kim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, it's really a delight for me to be here for all the reasons Kevin just described, um, but also as the descendant of people who arrived in North America on both kinds of ships. Um, and while I know the names of some of those ancestors, there are particular stories I will never know. So the work of our speakers today goes perhaps as close as can be done to telling those stories, to counter, as Professor Redeker says in his work, the violence of abstractions and how we speak about and study the slave trade and indeed diasporas of all kinds. Abstractions that disguise human suffering, the violence of dispossession and which make dehumanization possible, but also what the, the abstractions that obscure the full lived experience in all its complexity and fullness. And so before I introduce our speakers today, I just want to thank them for their work. Um, it's truly incredible to read these two books next to each other, and I can't wait for this conversation. So today joining us are uh, Kian McMahon, Associate Professor of Transnational History at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He's the author of two books and over half a dozen scholarly articles on Irish and American migration history. 
at UNLV, McMahon's transatlantic interests allow him to teach a range of courses in Irish, European, and American history. He also teaches seminars of his own design, including Great Migrations in Human History, Soccer and the Making of the Modern World, and Maritime Dimensions of Social History. His new book, The Coffin Ship, Life and Death at Sea During the Great Irish Famine, available from NYU Press, is the second monograph in the Glucksman Irish Diaspora series that's edited by Kevin Kenny. Next is Marcus Redeker, Distinguished Professor of Atlantic History at the University of Pittsburgh. His histories from below have won numerous awards, including the George Washington Book Prize, and have been translated into 17 languages worldwide. The Slave Ship, A Human History, published in 2007, won the George Washington Book Prize, the James Raleigh Prize, and the Merle Curti Award. He's produced a film, Ghost of Amistad, with director Tony Wuba, and written a play, The Return of Benjamin Lay, with playwright Naomi Wallace. He's currently writing a book about ex escaping slavery by sea and antebellum America. Amazing. And our moderator today, um, Hidetaka Hirota, is an associate professor in the Department of English Studies at Sophia U University in Japan. A historian of US immigration specializing in nativism, immigration law and policy, and transnational history, he's the author of Expelling the Poor, Atlantic Seaboard States and the 19th Century Origins of American Immigration Policy um, by Oxford in 2017 which re received the first book award from the Immigration and Ethnic History Society and the Donald Murphy Prize from the American Conference for Irish Studies. He's currently writing a book that examines the tension between American nativism and demand for immigrant labor in the long, long 19th century. With that, I will hand it over to our guests. Just a note again, if you want to ask questions, please press the Q&A button and enjoy this amazing conversation to come. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Kim, um, for a very kind introduction. And um, uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming up to, to this event. And um, it's a tremendous honor to uh, moderate this conversation um, between the two uh, famed historians. Um, so I'd like to start uh, the event by asking, first of all, uh, each of the speakers to briefly introduce the kinds of work um, you do uh, and, and they do, and then uh, the books that uh, they will uh, discuss today. And, you know, um, I know uh, many of the uh, people in the audience already know uh, those speakers, but, uh, you know, I think uh, this will be a help, helpful starter. So um, I would like to start with uh, Marks and uh, Kian will follow. Oops. Uh, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Ide. Uh, my name is Marcus Redeker, and uh, I write, uh, as Kim said, history from below. Uh, I've written several books about the ordinary working people who are frequently left out of the top-down uh, national histories, uh, but who in fact have shaped the world that we lived in, not only shaped it, but in fact built it. Uh, one of these works is uh, the book we're going to discuss today, uh, the Slave Ship, A Human History. Uh, I originally uh, wrote this book because uh, I saw that in 2007, 2008, we were going to be having the bicentennial of the abolition of the slave trade in Great Britain and the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. And I uh, intended this book to be a contribution to a debate about the legacy of the slave trade and slavery in the world in which we live. Uh, because in my view, uh, especially after writing this book, uh, we live with the consequences of those slave ships every minute of every day. Uh, the United States, there was not much of a discussion of the legacy of slavery. This was uh, partly because the Bush administration refused to fund events. Uh, you would think that this having been one of the most uh, virtuous things the U.S. government has ever done that it would that you would want to celebrate it, but of course it couldn't be celebrated because slavery went on long after 1808, and this is and remains a very explosive subject. 
So, uh, so I think uh, in, in a way the book has acquired a new significance uh, in the post George Floyd era. Uh, the uh, public execution of George Floyd, I think has raised urgent issues. Uh, and I am uh, extremely happy to be in conversation uh, with Keon about his uh, excellent new book. Uh, and, and I do hope we will spend most of our time talking about that. So Keon, over to you. Hi, uh, th thanks, Marcus, and um, and and I want to uh, thank everybody uh, for for tuning in uh, from from uh, all over, uh, as you said, the world. It's uh, it's it's deeply flattering and and wonderful uh, to be here. Thanks, obviously, to everyone at, at Glucksman Ireland House, uh, and uh, to Kevin Kenny for bringing this new book series together. There's been a lot of work uh, on the transnational dimensions of the Irish at home and abroad over the last 10 years, but it's lacked a institutional focal point. Uh, and so I'm really excited uh, that this uh, book series uh, has been founded. I'm uh, deeply uh, excited uh, to be part of it. And, uh, and I'm really excited to see that there's a new book uh, coming out in 2022 on the, the uh, global history of the Irish Revolution. So, so fantastic, just fantastic to be to, to be part of it. Um, and thanks obviously to Hide for tuning in all the way from Tokyo to, to moderate today's discussion. Um, and to Marcus, uh, you know, uh, I, as some of you may know, I, uh, I, I had a, I, this, this book came, the, the idea for the coffin ship came to me in a flash uh, on, on a specific night uh, in Pittsburgh um, years ago when I was a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon which is across the hollow from the University of Pittsburgh. So there's a lot of fantastic cross-fertilization between these two universities and the history departments. So there was this talk, there was, there was word that Marcus Redeker was giving a talk about a new book he was working on called The Slave Ship. And I went to this thing and it blew my mind. And what it, as I walked home that evening, what really struck me was this question that turned and tumbled around in my head, which was, what would a what would a book like that look like in Irish studies? And it and it dawned on me, the words came out of my mouth, the, the coffin ship. As a as a kid growing up in Ireland, I had heard this phrase coffin ship often used, but it curdled in my mind over the years. I recognized that the term was originally invented as a way to commemorate those who had died during the famine those who'd been expropriated, those who'd been exploited. And I recognized that that's where the term came from. But you know, listening to and reading Marcus's work, not only on slaves, but also on sailors, pirates, mutineers, et cetera, I realized that that term had actually served to strip those emigrants and those people of their creativity, of their agency, of their liveliness, of their, of their very humanity. And so I started to make, at a broader sense, to connect with Marcus's idea of the abstraction, the violence of abstraction. So I, so I committed myself to pursuing this project. And what I found was that, was that I had, there were three kind of ideas or goals that I had for the book. I'm gonna list these very briefly and then I'd like to turn it back to Hide so we can get the conversation going. But there are three kind of points that I wanted to, to get across in the book. The first was that I really wanted to listen and amplify the voices of the immigrants themselves. You know, in traditional histories of the great famine, there's a chapter on immigration. And those chapters are often dominated by accounts of government bureaucrats, landlords, workhouses. And this makes sense because a lot of historians find those sources, government papers, workhouse papers, landlord papers, easier to access. And the second thing is that they've never seen Marcus Redeker give a lecture on how to write a book. And so I found that for myself, the excitement was in listening to the immigrants' voices themselves. And in a subject that I'm sure we'll discuss in a minute, I, I, I had the benefit of, of access to letters and diaries for those immigrants, which largely don't exist uh, for slaves. 
for reasons we'll we'll discuss in a minute. So the first thing was I wanted to listen, wanted to amplify, I wanted to build this book on the voices and experiences of the of the immigrants themselves. The second thing I wanted to do was that I wanted to bring maritime social history into Irish studies. I was completely convinced by books, and not only by by Marcus, but by many others as well, of the ways in which the 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 sea voyage provided opportunities for reconfiguring, for challenging, for rebuilding social relations, especially in the 19th century in a world in which social relations are strictly hierarchical, patriarchal, racist, sexist, et cetera. So the second thing was I wanted to see what maritime history could do to open up new questions. And the third thing I wanted to do was to compare, contrast, connect the Irish at home and abroad in the 19th century. So when I started graduate studies, in the early 2000s, I read an article by our own Kevin Kenny here, in which he discussed the theoretical and methodological implications of doing diasporic history. And the main point that Kevin made in that article was that it's not merely enough to compare and contrast groups of people in different parts of the world. We also need to connect them to pull apart, to unearth those transnational networks that connected them. We need to do both. And so in my first book, which was on racial identity in the mid 19th century amongst the Irish, I explored those compare, contrast, connect methodologies. And I continued it in this project too. So as, so, as such, the book is designed really to both commemorate and recognize and analyze the, the suffering that, that many of these people went through. But it's also critically to restore their creativity, their agency, and you know, ironically in a book called The Coffin Ship, to, to reanimate their humanity. So I'm gonna stop there, I'm gonna turn it back to Hide, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, um, uh, Marks and uh, Kian, this is great. Um, yeah, so why don't we, yeah, uh, on, on, on that basis, why don't we uh, move on to uh, the conversation? So we, we're now going to think about the slave ship and the coffin ship uh, together. And it, it seems like, uh, you know, uh, uh, at least uh, based on those uh, the titles, uh, the history of, uh, of two ships, um, you know, has uh, common things like uh, misery, horror, or you know, things like these, like themes like this. But at the same time, I think uh, we should draw distinctions um, between those two ships rather than, you know, uncritically conflating them. So my first question is, um, what were the major fundamental differences between the slave ship and the coffin ship? Like, uh, so what are some of the, uh, the premises, so to speak, that we should keep in mind in, in discussing uh, these two ships together? So some of these uh, may be self-evident, um, but, uh, but I think it's worthwhile to really, you know, establish some, you know, you know clarification here. So, um, yeah, you know, any of you uh, can start. Go ahead, Marcus. Okay, thank you, Kian. Um, how were the slave ship and the coffin ship different? Uh, I want to begin with a few points that emerge in uh, Kian's book uh, as a way of thinking about the differences. First of all, the centrality of family groupings on the uh, so-called coffin ships. Uh, there were uh, families aboard the slave ships, but they were always separated. So that, that's a fundamental social unit that operates differently on the two ships. Uh, Keon also says a fair amount about clothing, bedding, luggage, and property. These were issues for the transatlantic Irish, but they were not issues for the Africans in this sense. Uh, clothing was limited to uh, loincloth, usually for women, sometimes for men. There was no bedding, uh, sleeping on the raw planks with the rolling of the sea, uh, rubbed the skin off of people's bodies. Uh, there was no luggage except what people brought in their minds and their hearts. Uh, there was no property. The expropriation of the uh, people aboard the slave ships was complete. 
A third thing that arises in Keon's book, which is actually a very interesting difference, is that there is a bit of paternalism and moral economy uh, in the Irish migration because of the involvement of landlords who uh, sponsor, uh, he says, 50 to 100,000 people. There's also some protection and assistance by the British and American governments. And of course, the contrast here could hardly be greater because one of the attraction of the slave trade to the British ruling class was that it required no moral consideration whatsoever. The only consideration was profits. And then just to uh, use a couple of small facts to illustrate the difference, uh, for the African slave trade, it's hard to imagine an immigrant's guide to the United States, which was published, or a humanitarian organization such as the Immigrant Protection Society. Uh, the fact that these things are unthinkable points to the differences, but those are not even the main differences. I want to talk now about four bigger differences, four points. Uh, I, I do think it's very important that Kian points out that uh, around 600,000 people in the period that he studies, 1845 to 1855, were evicted from the land and that it is not realistic to call their migration voluntary. It's more complicated than that. Even so, there were a larger number of people for whom there was some element of choice. And this is a big difference because as far as I know, no one ever chose to be shipped on a slaver. So degree of choice, that's one. Second, degree of crowding on board the ship. Uh, the U.S. Uh, had rules they weren't always obeyed, but uh, of, of two people for every five tons of shipping capacity. The British government, uh, three people for every five tons of shipping capacity. For the slave ships, the figures were reversed. Five people for three tons of shipping capacity, and that is only after the Humanitarian Dolben Act of 1788. So, uh, if you do the arithmetic here, you'll see the slave ships were roughly three times more crowded. Point number two, degree of crowding. Point three, degree of mortality. Keon produces a lot of good evidence about the mortality rate. He finds that it's a, a little over 1% uh, for those years, 1845 to 55, in general, higher on some routes. For the same years in the slave trade, the mortality rate is 11.5%. So 11 times higher. The presence of premature death is much higher on the slave ships. And then fourth, and this is really the one I want to underline uh, most, uh, most significantly, uh, the degree of violence. The, these two kinds of ships had different systems of social control different systems of trying to manage the human beings on board them. The Irish system, Keon emphasizes, is based on violence, but also on religion. That's a significant part of it. And I would add the family is itself a, a, kind of a form of social discipline. So, so that's, that's an issue. The slave trade is basically, uh, people on those ships are ruled by linguistic, ethnic, and national division. But even more importantly, they are ruled through torture and abject terror, which included the routine rape of women. The slave ships were organized to annihilate individual and collective identity. For example, stripping people's names and assigning them a number. The coffin ships were not. So my conclusion through all this is that the slave ship is degree zero, of extreme expropriation and oppression, or as Walter Rodney put it, the slave ship is capitalism without a loincloth. Uh, but then again, there's another important thing we need to keep in mind. Even though the slave trade brought a much larger number of people, 11 to 12 million to the new world, I think the number for the Irish is maybe 4 million over a long period of time, there were actually more Irish who came to what is now the United States on the coffin ships than came via the slave ships. So that may be something worth thinking about. So uh, Keon, over to you.
Yeah, thank you. You know, when when uh, when I th when I thought of this question, the um, uh, I, I'm I'm only going to um, kind of there's just a few points I'd like to emphasize that Marcus because um, because Marcus has uh, has has um, has really laid out I think in a really clear way uh, the main the main differences. Um, there, there's a couple of points that that I that I want to emphasize. When I first thought about this question. Uh, the very first thing that I wrote down was, was the the two words I wrote down were were smash relationships. That the slave ship's job was not merely to put people in chains, transport them to a market, and and move them on into the system. As Marcus makes clear in the slave ship, the the slave ship's job was to smash relationships, to reduce human beings down to a finite number of sellable commodities. So I'll, that's the first thing I'd like to emphasize is, is, that, is that relationships were not only allowed to foster or be fostered uh, on these immigrant ships, but that actually the authorities recognized, as Marcus just hinted, the authorities recognized that in the maintenance of families as basic units of organization on the ship, that, uh, that, that, the, that the ship captains and officers had within them, within the ship, small little micro hierarchies, which were easier to deal with. So for example, there was a lot of talk about, um, married Christian men, you know, not all immigrants were treated equally, right? There are some who are given positions of authority within the ship. So, so, so that's, so that's one point I want to, I want to emphasize. It's a, and it's a great one that, that Marcus, that Marcus made. The second thing is that we need to remember is that from a constitutional perspective, Irish immigrants in the mid 19th century are British subjects. They're entitled to a certain number of uh, rights and responsibilities, but rights um, that are not always recognized by ship captains. And there's lots in the book about the ways in which some of these captains uh, ignore the rights. But I'll give, you a, I'll give you a concrete example again. On a whim, while doing this research, I started reading through the Liverpool Mercury's police court blotter, which is like a a column that was in the newspaper every two or three days and it would give little blurbs of a journalist who sat in court and basically wrote down stories that he thought were funny or interesting and i was shocked by the number of immigrants irish immigrants in liverpool who were taking ship owners shipping brokers captains to court for having been beaten defrauded, stolen from, et cetera. In fact, you would think of an Irish immigrant a long way from home in Liverpool, scared out of their wits, having to engage with the court system with which they may have no experience or, and or maybe deeply suspicious. How are they gonna represent their interests in this court? Do you know that the emigration agent, so the government's kind of overseer of the ships in Liverpool, had a little part in his job description, which was to represent immigrants in court. So immigrants were not being represent, were not representing themselves. They were re being represented by a naval, a retired naval officer in a court to protect their rights as British subjects. We don't have to start going into how this didn't happen in the slave ship. This is the, this is the exact opposite. The third point I'll emphasize is the attitude towards death and burial at sea. So as sailing ships in the early modern period become capable of spending more and more time at sea and traveling greater distances, sailors and officers begin to, um, begin to adjust and amend burial practices, which have been developed over centuries, of course, on land, They're, they have to be re redeveloped to work at sea. And those involve things like 
covering the body in a shroud, weighing the body so that it sinks in the, in the same way, mimicking perhaps the burial in land, a prayer service, a kind of a vibe around the ship when somebody dies. There's a hush tones. There's respect for the family. I have some experiences or some examples of what in Ireland, in Irish society call a wake, right? A pre-burial kind of getting, get together, celebration, time together. This was seen again by the ship captains and by the ship owners as a way to maintain that sense of control and propriety, just this moderation and discipline on the ships. When you read the slave ship and you see the way in which the African uh, slaves bodies were treated both before and after death, you see the marked contrast. So I'm going to stop there because there's lots of great things to talk about, but but I but those are the main points that I would emphasize. Thank you, Hide. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, this is very helpful. You know, you guys really uh, uh, let let out the um, yeah kind of the uh, uh, foundations for this conversation. Um, so both of you in your books um, point out that uh, historians, you know, whether uh, historians of slave slave trade, Atlantic slave trade, or, or Irish immigration, tend to overlook the very process of migration itself. You know, Atlantic, Atlantic slave trade and Irish immigration are the fields that have been extensively studied, right? Um, but nevertheless, there is a kind of uh, historiogra historiographical blank. Uh, you know, historians tend to, once again, overlook, uh, I guess, the most important process, you know, part of the whole process. Um, but um, in your view, what explains this? You know, what, exp what explains this tendency or, you know, or historians neglect failure to focus on the process of migration? Um, is this a problem of sources or is this a problem of the way historiography has been organized or is this due to something else? Kian, why don't you go first this time? Okay, thank you, Marcus. I'll make a couple of points and, and then maybe you can unpack the ones that, because uh, I know we share a lot of our, our same interests and, and, and starting points on, on this. Um, there's a question uh, that, uh, that Marcus deals with, I think it's in his book, Outlaws, um, uh, in which he talks about terracentrism uh, as being baked into uh, not only historiography, but also modern society as a whole. So by terracentrism, uh, we mean that, I mean that, that, uh, that idea that what happens on land is the only thing that's important in, our, in, in studying history. And that what happens at the sea, the sea is this kind of ill-defined in-between space that, we, uh, that isn't really worth, that, that is something to be endured rather than understood. And Marcus makes this point about terracentrism, but it goes beyond the study of history and it's baked into, in fact, modern society, which is organized along the lines of nations and nationalism, hierarchical for a long time and still to a great degree patriarchal and racist nation states that define how we think about ourselves. Oceans and seas don't fit nicely into the modern nation state. And so that's a big part, I think, of, of why the migration process itself has been ignored is because of this terracentrism that's been baked into, that's been baked into our way of thinking. The second quick point I'll make relates to something that Hide mentioned, which is sources. The Ability to find, it's difficult to find letters and diaries of the voice of, uh, sorry, amplifying the voices of immigrants themselves, right? Um, and so one problem is finding the sources themselves, but another problem is in being able to, to approach government reports, parliamentary reports, landlord papers, et cetera, and to read between the lines, to read between the lines. Uh, of those of those reports and letters, to try, in other words, to find the voices of the immigrants, or in Marcus's case, the slaves, pirates, and sailors, to find their voices buried 
in the least likely of places in the in the voices of of those in of those in control so so that so that is just a, two points that i would make off the bat is that the terracentrism and, and the sources um uh, marcus i'll turn it to you okay thank you kian yeah i would add to that that uh, a, a corollary of this terracentrism meaning land centered history is that the seas of the world are somehow ahistorical voids. There are places where history really doesn't happen. History happens on land within nation states. That's the naturalized form that we're meant to understand. Now, there are some kinds of history that clearly do happen at sea. The history of exploration is one, so-called exploration, uh, and the uh, and naval history obviously, but most national histories treat the seas as relatively marginal to their own becoming uh, and their own future. So I think that uh, one of the things that these two books have in, have in common is that uh, they try to show that history actually happens on board these ships, uh, that very important historical processes are playing out you know, class formation, race formation. These, these things are happening at sea if we will just look, look closely. Think of the sea as a real place as opposed to a void uh, between uh, uh, the real spaces of nations. So, so I think that that is, that is an issue. Uh, I do think sources, as Kian says, are a, a very significant uh, issue. I think that the integration of maritime history into national histories uh, is actually happening because if uh, maritime working people were marginal to the national histories, there turns out they're quite central to Atlantic and Oceanic and world histories because it's frequently their labor that makes the connection. And then the, here, here's the final point. Uh, and this, I think, is one way in which Keon's book is really valuable for people in so many fields. Uh, the truth is that the, the migration experience is mediated by the ship. It's a fundamental point for uh, a period of several centuries. It's fundamentally mediated by the ship. So what does that mean for culture formation? What does it mean for the nature of any given diaspora? Uh, I, I think this is really something we, we do need to keep in mind uh, as we try to overcome that sort of uh, terracentric approach that is, is built into the way we see the past. And by, and by the way, let me just add, it's all the more powerful uh, as a way of limiting thought because it's an uninspected bias. Uh, even though 90% of the world's com commerce travels by sea, most people have relatively little to do with seafaring peoples anymore. So it's just, a, there's a level of invisibility that needs to be overcome. Marcus, may I just follow up with a quick, uh, uh, have you, what do you think about the, one thing that I kind of um, chewed over as I was thinking about the, this question too, is the question of the degree to which, um, uh, the history of capitalism, if you will, or the our understanding of kind of the development of global capitalism is one that's rooted in stories uh, and the technologies of the sea. Do you think that it's that it's that that emphasis on on kind of, as you said, great quote unquote explorers, great naval battles and great admirals, and I'm using the word great in quotation marks here. Do you think that part of it is also that 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 the um, a, a question or a battle over history from the bottom up mm -hmm. as a whole, that, that, it's, that it's a history of the bottom up kind of um, uh, pivoting towards the maritime. And does that maybe find, well, does that have its detractors and, uh, and, and in, in historiography more broadly? Well, I, I'd say two things in response to that, Kian. First of all, in my view, the ship is the most important machine in the rise of capitalism. We've got to think of it as a technology. It is the most sophisticated technology of its day. Uh, and the power that 
these states of Northwestern Europe were able to project through the use of these tall ships is, uh, is, is extremely important. But yes, I, I do believe that there is an old naval history from above of uh, the admirals, uh, the, the stories of Nelson and the like. So you're right that maritime history from below is a real challenge. And I must say, I have taken a few arrows for that over the years. Well, still, you know, thank you uh, for your thoughts, but you know, nevertheless, despite those challenges, uh, well, you know, I, I, I'd like to, uh, I'd like, I'd like, I'd like you to this, uh, develop this point further, but you know, before that, you know, Despite those challenges, uh, both of you, um, I you know I I, I want to say um, overcame um, you know the methodological difficulty and challenges, and then brilliantly um, illuminated the uh, migration experiences of uh, uh, African slaves and the, uh, the Irish, and so and and as a result, you know um, I I want so what happened. To, to your work, like uh, so, um, you know, as I said, you know, both slave ship and coffin ship um, are the institutions that have been uh, more or less, you know, you know, studied a lot. Uh, and but but I think I think the fact is these these are the institutions that are more imagined than empirically studied, right? So um, as a result of, of your uh, you know uh, uh, admirable challenges to to those methodological difficulties. Um, um, how, how does your book kind of challenge, you know, uh, revise any of the widely shared uh, images of these ships? Yeah, why don't you take, it, take that one? Well, yeah, Marcus, you know, I was going to say that, I, that my work builds on, uh, builds on yours. So maybe if you start us off, then, uh, then I, yeah, that might make more sense. Is that okay? Sure. Well, I, I usually start this kind of discussion talking about the romance of the tall ship. Through many parts of the West, there is this uh, extraordinary romanticism that is attached to these tall vessels. And you know, there are a couple of hundred replica vessels of tall ships around the world now. And you've probably seen them sailing into this or that harbor. And they are really magnificent and majestic things to see. But of course, uh, what this means is that the most important of these ships, let's say, the slave ship and the coffin ship are the ones that people don't want to talk about because they interfere with the romance. I think that's that's kind of one of one of the issues. Uh, mm. So what you know what I try to do. This is something that uh, Kim mentioned uh, and that Keon mentioned. Uh, I think that when we talk about the history of these violent trades uh, in, in human beings, we need to fight the violence of abstraction. This to me is the single most important thing. And I think the, the, the need to tell a truly human history of what happens on board these vessels is one of the most important things that we can do. And, and this, of course, Dion, was uh, your main goal. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, as I said, I, I was inspired to write this book by, by Marcus's uh, work on the slave ship. And partly, I think what was going on there, as I said, I wanted to bring maritime social history into Irish studies, but you know, I also wanted to bring Irish studies into maritime social history, if you will. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, in, in Marcus's body of work, he's showing connections between what we might think of as unlikely uh, uh, groups of, of people at sea. Um, as I've said before, sailors, pirates, mutineers, and slaves. And what I really wanted to do was to understand the degree to which we might benefit from bringing immigrants more fully into that, into, into that story. I said at the beginning that, that these terms are used as shorthand, and they're sometimes, and they're often used in the case of the coffin ship, we'll say, they're used to commemorate and to remember. And indeed the coffin ship, I, I subsequently did some research on, 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 the, on the term itself. And I, I used digitized databases of, of Irish newspapers, you know, to, to find out like, when did the term start really being used in earnest? 
and uh, and it turns out that it was it was decades after the famine was over that the, that the that the famine coffin ship becomes a kind of a part of popular memory or popular popular discourse and that ties into um justifications for political uh, and agrarian reform uh, in Ireland in the in the late 19th century. So what I wanted to try to do was to at, to at once to kind of bring some depth to a rather one dimensional image that has been allowed to sit un, untroubled, uh, collecting dust now for a long time, but also at a broader level to try to encourage my colleagues and myself to see how we can bring emigrants into these broader discussions um, of what you might call history from below, working class history, et cetera. Thank you, Hide. Thank you. Um, I, I guess uh, this will be my uh, final question before we, we move on to Q and A. But I, you know, again, uh, you know, history from below, uh, social history, uh, you know, that's what we do and what that's what we discuss here, and that's a tremendously important, um, you know, field of history. But I, I wanted to ask about I want to I want to ask you about um, the writing of this history. You know how how what it is like to write this history. So uh, you know your books illuminate extreme sadness and human resilience. And I suspect that, you know, writing this, your, your, your books um, was an emotionally uh, disturbing, moving experience in many ways. And uh, I'm sure you had this kind of sense of uh, irritation, anger, relief, you know, various kinds of emotions uh, as you wrote your books. Um, so can you please tell us how you dealt with this kind of emotional aspect of writing? Uh, writing your book, um, that did, did those emotions, uh, you know, irritations, anger, whatever, uh, do you think, uh, do you think those uh, re, uh, emotions um, affected your writing, your argument in any ways? That's a good question, Hide. Um, well, I would say that you know, I never, I, I never in, in, in history writing as in life, I, I never, I never encounter a challenge without looking for it embedded in it, an opportunity. And, and, uh, and I would say that in coming to terms with and coming to understand some of the experiences uh, of the, uh, of, of emigrants uh, in this incredible, difficult moment in modern history in the mid 19th century, I would say that it opened up some opportunities for me. So I, I, I looked in, I looked, if you will, on, on the, on the, I tried to look on the positive side and, and the things that I came away with were um, some of the things that I came away with were, were first of all, you know, an incredible amount of creativity and actual flexibility uh, on, on behalf of, of emigrants. These were folks who were coming from largely rural society. Literacy is, I mean, maybe coming up to close to 50%, but is uneven. It's mo literacy is mostly in the urban areas. These folks, a lot of them do not speak English. If they do, they certainly don't read English or write English. And so the ways in which they managed to embark on this, to, to execute this huge voyage was one that required great creativity and bravery and flexibility. And I was, that's one of the things that I, that I, really, that I really got away, that I took away from it. I'll also say that in understanding their treatment of death and mortality, dealing with dead bodies, respect for their families. And then the book looks at the statistics on mortality as, as, as Marcus hinted at earlier. And I, and I figured out, you know, I learned it. I got a more complicated picture, we'll say of mortality during the famine at sea. I was also interested in the second section of that chapter. I look at how death was handled on the ships. But then I also looked at the ways in which death was handled after arrival. And I learned that death became, for Irish immigrants during the famine and soon after, became a way, a talking point, a way to connect with each other, if you will. 
a way to work towards repairing and rebuilding. So by sharing news and updates on friends who had died or friends who had recovered from illness, um, immigrants at home, and well, I should say the Irish at home and abroad managed to develop and repair and rebuild their relationships. And in that own way, I, I, I thought of my own, my own family and my own experience as an immigrant with family, you know, on both sides of the ocean and the ways in which and the ways in which we maintain our relationships. So the emigration, as Cormac O'Grada, the great historian of the Irish famine, has written that emigration was a part of famine relief, how people responded to and survived the famine. I agree with that. And then I tried to push it one step further and to say that emigration was actually part of how the Irish community recovered from the famine in the years after. So I'll turn it to Marcus. Thank you. Yes, uh, Hide, I want to thank you for this question because it's a question that is rarely asked. Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that every book has a secret emotional life. Uh, and certainly uh, The Slave Ship was uh, by far the most difficult book uh, I have ever tried to write. It was an experience of uh, sorrow. It was an experience frequently of rage of not believing some of the things that you were reading, but you read them repeatedly. Uh, and if you wanna do history from below, you have to try to live with the horror that people experienced on board those ships. Uh, so so it, it, it really does take a toll. But here's the other thing that to me was uh, in many ways the saving grace to see that under the most extreme circumstances imaginable. I mean, I think it was uh, William Wilberforce who said, never has so much misery been concentrated in so small a space. In that small space, people fought back in every conceivable way. In every conceivable way, they waged insurrections. They waged hunger strikes. You could see uh, the Atlantic slave trade in some ways as a 400 year hunger strike. Tremendous struggle over that, over whether you're going to eat and survive the Middle Passage. So to be able to see that, to see that the people who were enslaved in those, on those horrific lower decks never accepted that reality and did everything they could to resist it uh, this to me was was probably the the single most important thing to learn about this uh, uh, this this historical experience. Thank you so much. Um, this is really uh, in intellectually interesting and helpful. You know, I, I, you know, since you know my, myself, you know, I uh, write history of uh, deportation and you know in, you know immigrant deportation and, and you know it's a lot of. Uh, suffering and also resilience as well so you know i, I really I, I, I i'm always curious to hear uh how social historians uh legal historians uh think about this question anyway thank you now um i'd like to move on to q a you know although you know i wish you know we have more time um for uh the conversation between you two but um so we are having numerous questions right here. And so uh, apologies in advance to everyone that, you know, um, we need to be very selective, in fact, um, uh, in answering the questions. Um, but um, so, so let me just pick up this question. Um, th th this should be interesting. Th th this may be beyond the scope of your research or specialization, but uh, there's a question about Another uh, major form of migration, uh, mainly in the 19th century, that's uh, Chinese migration or so-called coolie trade. You know, Kian's work is very interesting because uh, it, it shows how the contemporary image of coffin ship kind of obscured the range and complexity of, of migration experiences. But then by contrast, Marx, Marx's book uh, shows um, how uh, slave traders actually uh, intentionally kind of uh, simplify, you know, um, um, the real situations uh, to, to cover the, the horror, you know, horrible conditions, right? So, so in, in, light, in light of this, you know, um, 
I, uh, this person is asking about uh, 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 Chinese migrant uh, uh, immigration of Chinese uh, migrant laborers. And there's a lot of overlap between Chinese migration and your books here. So um, um, on the one hand, you know, Chinese migration um, involved terrible abuses. Um, but at the same time, you know, enemies of the Chinese um, distorted you know, anti-Chinese or kind of manipulated anti-slavery anti image to say that, hey, Chinese were slaves, that Chinese coolies were slaves. Therefore, they should be uh, excluded from the United States because U.S. banned slavery. So, so there's a lot of, um, you know, simpli simpli simplification or manipulation of the image of Chinese migration. So um, uh, I know this may be beyond your specialization, but uh, what kind of insights uh, could we gain? Um, by approaching the history of this coolie ship uh, through um, what what we discussed about coffee and ship or slave ship. Well, uh, that, that, that's a good yeah. That's a really interesting question. I, I've I've kind of wondered about this. Although, as you say, it's not a it's not it's not my uh, field of of specialization. But you know, um, I I I was recently reading something on uh, on on the history of convictism and convict transportation uh in the 18th century and uh and um one of these books pointed out that uh a number of um we'll call them uh migrants uh bound migrants uh got on the ship uh labeled uh, uh convicts but got off the ship in maryland uh labeled um I think it's uh, workers or, or um, uh, laborers, and uh, and I thought this is really interesting because it shows that there's that there's something that happens in the transportation of people that changes their status, uh, as, whether that's their status in a racial status, uh, whether that's their uh, employment status, um, and so I would say that 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 at, at first glance, if you will, my, my initial thought would be, I would be really interested in understanding what the laborers themselves thought they were and who they were when they were, when they were getting, when they were going, when they were get embarking on the ships to see how their, their ideas about themselves and what they were doing and where they were going maybe changed on the ships and then to compare that again to how they to how they were to how they were received, I think I think that that would be I, I mentioned it I can't remember I think I've written it somewhere where I said was it on the ships that that Chinese laborers became quote unquote coolies, in other words when did they start being used this when did that derogatory term start to being applied to them so that might be one way to approach it. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. No, I I really like this question because it it makes us think uh, comparatively. In a new way. And what I would uh, uh, say in response to this question is that uh, I have always thought of the Middle Passage not simply as a, a historical phenomenon, but as a concept. The Middle Passage is what exists between expropriation in one place, whether that place is West Africa or Ireland or China, Expropriation, middle passage, exploitation in a new location. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, the, this can be studied for many different trades, including, as Kian has just mentioned, the convict trade to North America, to West Africa for a short time, and eventually to Australia. And he's written about this uh, very, very well. So, so I think we need to think about the middle passage as kind of a, a concept and and, and it's another way in which the African slave trade is an epitome that can illuminate other kinds of, uh, of, of passages. Now, I, I would also add that, uh, you know, one of the most important things about uh, this, this middle passage is, as, and Kian has written about this too, is fictive kinship, the new bonds that are formed. So what kinds of bonds are being formed in each situation? What kinds of new bonds are being formed among the workers from China, uh, from Ireland? And this actually leads me to want to ask a question of Kian. Uh, do you think, you don't 
quite come out and say it, but I, I just wonder, do you think that a new and more internationalist conception of Irishness is being formed on those ships? And let me just give you the, 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 the comparative thing for me is you look at the, the slave trade, if you look at it from one end, uh, it's a Pan-African experience of bringing together many different peoples from West Africa. If you look at it from the Western side, you could see the cultural transformations that happening happening aboard the ship as the beginnings of an African America in the broadest sense, not a national sense, but a hemispheric sense. So I'm just wondering if you think, uh, if you can talk a little bit about how the ship is producing something new in terms of how the uh, mobile Irish see themselves. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question, Marcus. You know, I uh, and and it's something I actually, ironically, uh, discussed uh, and talk about in my first book, uh, which doesn't which doesn't explicitly consider the role of the ship. But now your question and this book come together uh, nicely in an interesting way. So what I found was that before, so what I found was that before the famine, which starts in 1845 and goes into the 1850s. Irish people, along with other Europeans, tended to think of themselves and their, and I'm using this word carefully, racial identity, okay? And I say I'm using it carefully because I spent 10 years reading about it and it's complicated and it's difficult and it's, it's, a, it's a very important issue for us to understand. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna snow you under with disclaimers at the moment. I'm just gonna say that when before the famine, Irish people tended to think of themselves as as being rooted in the land, in the landscape. You 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 often see in poetry, in uh, in newspaper editorials, and speeches, this the idea that the Irish people that their language is suited to the rivers, that it grows out of the mountains, that there's something in the landscape that shapes their identity. And then over the course of 40 years, between 1840 and 1880, 4 million people out of a population in the 1840s of about, about 8 point whatever, 8.5 we'll say, over the next 40 years, 4 million people. This would be the equivalent in the United States, of course, of like over the next 40 years, like whatever, 180 million people just upping and leaving the United States and moving all around the world. I mean, th this would completely have this earth shattering impact on how Americans would think of themselves. And it did have that impact on the Irish. Irishness became a thing that you could be anywhere in the world. And this was, a, this was a, an ability to maintain two kinds of national identities. On the one hand, an ethnic identity, which is that loyalty predicated on shared heritage, ancestry, language. And then that civic nationalism, that loyalty predicated on shared values, beliefs, ideals. So the Irish became, by the 1880s, a group of people who could be both Irish. As they said, one, one editorial said in New York in the 1870s, American by nationality, yet Irish by race. What didn't occur to me when I was writing that first book was the intrinsic role that the sailing ship played in all of this. Because as the sailing ship is the instrument by which people move all over, move all over the world. And as such, I really think it's important for historians of migration to start to carefully think more clearly about the ways in which the sailing ship and later the steamship has played a role in the histories of migration. For a long time, histories of immigration in the United States were what happened when they were in Boston, New York. And then you had, well, what happened when they were in Ireland and then, and those are great. I think we are seeing now in this global transnational history is ways in which we're seeing networks developing across the world. And it's impossible for us to keep doing that without studying the ship. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So um, there's a question about, uh, once again, the process of migration itself and uh, something we haven't uh, really had a chance to 
discuss here is is the the impact of the process on on people or communities. So um, so there's a question about you know, how the the experiences in or around transportation affected uh, migrants themselves or the communities um, where those migrants eventually settled or developed. Um, any thoughts? Go ahead, Marcus. I think you're on mute, Marcus. Oops. No. Perfect. In the case of the uh, transatlantic slave trade, uh, one of the most important things in the aftermath of the voyage is that people will continue to die. Uh, they enter new uh, disease environments, and so the, the, the mass death, which actually begins in Africa, in, in the wars over the slave trade, in the long marches to the coast, uh, in the barracoons and the slave trading factories, on the ship, it continues when people get to the new world. So this is a, and, and this is going on over a long period of time. Another major difference between uh, the slave trade and the coffin ship trade is that you're on the slave ship for a much longer stretch. Mm -hmm. Many of those ships take eight to 12 months to gather a full cargo of people. So there's a lot more time for, for things to happen, but there, there's no question that the voyage itself uh, contributes to a prolonged mortality which will have profound effects on all uh, uh, communities of African people in the new world for a considerable period of time thereafter. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would only add that, um, you know, there was a fascinating, uh, I, I came across a fascinating table of information for 1847, which was the, the high point for emigrant mortality during the famine on the routes from Ireland and, and Liverpool, which is, considered a quote-unquote Irish port at the time, simply because so many Irish were, were sailing through Liverpool, uh, going to Quebec. And this table uh, managed to uh, account for every ship that left, how many people were on it when it left, how many, if any, were born on it, and then how many, how many died on the ship. So I started crunching the numbers, right? And I was interested to see were the highest mortality rates only on coming from the cities, like from the big port cities, Dublin, Belfast, Limerick, Cork? Uh, or were they actually from, from smaller towns and, and, and ports like Kilrush and Westport? And, uh, and what I found was that there was, that there was no correlation. Uh, I couldn't find any correlation between, between the size of the port and the mortality rate. What this told me was that the microbial uh, environments of individual ports uh, were, were the most important factor, right? So Irish people are leaving. These are folks who are suffering from, many are suffering from endemic long-term extreme malnutrition, which is leaving, and dehydration, which is leaving them susceptible to the diseases that are actually actually carrying them off in the uh during the famine on ships and on land people aren't actually dying in the greatest numbers of starvation per se they're actually dying of infectious diseases especially typhus but also cholera so i was in so i've become interested in the degree to which the port city is actually a greater story a greater part of the story of the sailing ship uh, than I, than I uh, had previously considered. And it was therefore uh, with uh, great excitement that I uh, noted uh, Marcus's current uh, book project on the port city, uh, the, the role of port cities in the, we'll say maritime dimensions of the, uh, of the Underground Railroad. I think the port city is another kind of part of the sailing ship uh, that uh, that it's important that we not that we not forget. Okay, thank you. So um, we have another question, and and uh, this question is really about uh, the ship building or ships, right? I mean, so again, the, the, those are kind of central uh, uh, things uh, for in the history that 
that we're discussing today. Um, but uh, can you either of you reflect on the role of shipbuilding? In the in your stories, you know, so Marx earlier said, you know, described uh, ships as the most sophisticated technology of of their era. Um, you know, during the Irish famine, uh, for example, uh, there is a major leap in tonnage, especially for packet ships that must have totally changed uh, the experience at sea for migrants. So, was there any uh, similar? Development in construction for slave ships. Um, you know, any that kind of you know development that really changed uh, the experience. You know, technology technological changes that changed uh, uh, the experience of slaves. And likewise, um, there's a question about the Irish immigrants uh, in relation to ships. Um, so, but this is a kind of factual question. But were any of the ships which transported uh, uh, slaves? Uh, also used to transport Irish migrants. So was there any kind of uh, actual actual overlap between the transportation of slaves and transportation of, of immigrants? Okay, so so let me say, so let me say first on the question of uh, I I don't I don't have specific uh, answers on on specific ships. The um, the slave trade uh, in North America uh, has come as officially uh, come to an end uh, by 1808, as Marcus said earlier. Uh, I study 1845. That's not to say that uh, slaves are not being illicitly uh, moved around on on the sea, um, but that is to say that um, that it's that if you go back to the 18th century, if you were to study Irish migration during the 18th century. I am sure you would find many important overlaps uh, because, and this is the second point I want to make, is that, you know, we tend to think of emigrant vessels as, um, as kind of purpose-built uh, ships that are designed for the emigrant trade. Uh, and then the way that we nowadays have coaches and big buses, right? And then we also have tractor trailers uh, for moving um, boxes and, and cargo. Uh, and those are two separate things. Um, and the only time that they ever get, that they ever overlap in our collective consciousness is when we learn of the people trafficking and refugees, uh, the trafficking of refugees, um, as for, of course, what, what is known as the Essex lorry deaths uh, in Ireland, um, when 39 Vietnamese um, refugees died uh, in a refrigerated uh, a trailer um, that was driven by an Irishman. Um, so we tend to think of these uh, as separately, except when they, when they, but of course, in reality, uh, at, at the time, uh, the ships were multi-purpose uh, uh, technologies that, that had to be capable uh, of doing lots of different things. Um, so for example, um, ships are cargo ships when they're coming across from Quebec or New Brunswick to Ireland because they're carrying um, strips of wood, deals and staves uh, to make barrels uh, to uh, as part of Ireland's agricultural output. Uh, then uh, they are having, uh, they're often having um, sleeping shelves roughly carpentered into them after they've been unloaded. And those are used for emigrant sleeping berths on the way back. So this happens back and forth. Now, there are some purpose-built, uh, uh, I wouldn't say purpose-built emigrant ships, but there are ships that have permanent bed structures. And in fact, a British bureaucrat writing in 1854 and talking about how fantastic American ships were said, hey, you know, some of these have permanent bed places. So it's complicated, I would say. Some ships are better than others. But that would be kind of my response today would, would be that it's that we that we need to understand that these are complicated technologies that are capable of doing multiple things uh, over the course of a year. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would just add that uh, two points. First, uh, any kind of sailing ship could be a slave ship from a, a small sloop to a huge ship that could carry 800, 900 people. But there does develop a, a, a quite specific vessel built in Liverpool 
beginning around the middle of the 18th century, when Liverpool is ascendant as the leading uh, slaving port city in the world, these are built especially for the slave trade uh, with certain features, double decks, uh, uh, barricados as they're called. Uh, but the other point is, and, and this is to, to reinforce what Kian just said, uh, the ship's carpenter is a very important uh, uh, artisan who can transform one kind of ship into another kind of ship very, very quickly. That said, there's no doubt in my mind that some of the vessels sailing out of Liverpool were involved in the slave trade. I mean, these wooden vessels can last 30, 40 years. So there's no doubt that some of them were, were, were involved. We do know that slave ships were used in the early convict trade. And I can tell you that anyone who went aboard one of those vessels would know it because uh, the story was that you could never actually get the smell out of a slave ship because of the concentrated misery and violence and, uh, and death. So, uh, so the vessels themselves are worthy of study, how that worked out. And uh, I'm very grateful that we have this major new study of the coffin ship. Great. So uh, we're uh, running slightly over, though there's no sign of the audience members going down. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not feeling pressure to, uh, to finish. It's um, This is an event we've been looking forward to uh, all year uh, to bring, uh, um, oh, it's blurred, but to bring these two uh, wonderful uh, books together and much more important to bring the authors and to, to thank um, Kim, and Hide for hosting, and Marcus um, and Kian for just such a great conversation. Now, clearly, we should have had a conference on this, uh, not, not, not a, a one and 15 uh, minute symposium. Can I close it out, though, by asking one final question as we still have so many people on live? Um, I've been wondering, uh, just as I learn about this incredibly rich field of inquiry, um, you know, what's next in maritime history? And I think the answer to that lies in the research uh, that both of you are doing. So I, I'd love to hear uh, Keon and then uh, Marcus. What, I mean, uh, what, what directions are you heading in in this field as, as, uh, to leave us with that thought? I, 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 already, I already hinted at Marcus's book. Marcus, can you tell us about uh, this, this, work you're, this book you're working on now? Uh, yes, I, I'm basically uh, writing a book about people who escaped slavery by sea in the 19th century. Uh, it turns out the numbers, I think, were much greater than we realized. Uh, and I'm very interested in the way in which the waterfront, uh, the docks, are basically a zone of struggle against slavery. Uh, because you have this meeting of many different kinds of workers you have uh, sailors coming into Southern ports. Uh, the, many of them are black. There's an effort to try to segregate these, uh, these uh, black sailors to keep them from having contact with black dock workers and people who are on the waterfront, but that doesn't seem to work. So what we've got is a situation in which there is a kind of maritime struggle against slavery, which I think is uh, uh, exceedingly important. Uh, and uh, there's been some good work done on this uh, recently, a very good book uh, uh, published, uh, edited by Tim Walker called Sailing to Freedom. Uh, but I think this is going to help us to think about uh, resistance to the slave system in a new way. That's, that's my hope. And so this is what I've been working on for the last couple of years. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's funny. Uh, the the Victorian Society of New York, which is a uh, which is an, an energetic group of folks who are uh, who are interested in all things nineteenth century related to New York, uh, invited me to to give a a, a public uh, uh, talk similar to this, and uh, and 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 the and the other author on it was Tim Walker. Uh, so, so Tim and I uh, were discussing uh, our books in, in tandem. I, I think that's really uh, important that uh, we avoid the uh, um, uh, dividing, uh, you know, enforcing dividing lines between ourselves in, in maritime history and that we all kind of um, bear in mind 
where we're going. I would say, uh, you know, I've, I, I, <laughs> I had a chat with Kevin Kenny uh, recently ab about about what next. Um, and um, Kevin's been such a great supporter of my work that uh, that I appreciated uh, him listening while I bounced some ideas off him. You know, it, it played a small role in, in this book, The Coffin Ship, but uh, I was really struck by the uh, by the degree to which uh, con uh, the convict transportation system uh, was explicitly uh, treated um, by some immigrants during the famine uh, as a as a as a as a free trans transportation to Australia. They explicitly said this uh, in in their letters, in their petitions. Um, and and this when I looked at the search, so that got me going. I started looking at surgeons' journals. There's a finite number of convict transports leaving Ireland during the famine, so it's possible to kind of to kind of get them together, get most of them together. I went to Kew, the uh, National Archives in Kew, and got my hands on some of them. And uh, what I found was that the surgeons' reports were 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 saying similar things. Uh, that that it was clear to the surgeons that some of the immigrants or some of the convicts uh, were people who had who explicitly told them that they committed a crime so that they could so that they could join them. This is I'm not suggesting that this is voluntary migration in the same way, of course, right? Because they're leaving a, a situation of total collapse. But I am saying that it's interesting to me that if I'm interested, if I need to get myself off the island, what are my options? So again, it goes back to that creativity, that bravery that, that I was interested in. So I said to, so I was discussing this anyway with Kevin and, and uh, I was thinking of um, one of the things I've noticed about the, the histories of, and this is changing now, there's a great new book um, coming out about convictism of global history, but I'm interested in traditional histories of convictism kind of break it up into two. You can kind of either do 18th century colonial America, or you can do 19th century Australia. And traditional histories also leave the voyage itself out. So I'm interested in perhaps starting to pursue a project which tries to do two things. First of all, to focus on the convict voyage as a dynamic in the history of convictism, but also of bound labor more broadly. And then also to see what happens if we bring colonial America and Australia uh, into, the same, into the same analytical framework. So I'm moving towards convictism, but again, looking at it as a form of, of free slash unfree migration. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much to everybody, to Marcus, to Kevin, to Hide, Kim, Miriam, everybody who played such an important role in, in bringing this together. It's been absolutely fantastic working with you, and I look forward to, to working with you more in the future. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs>